Good afternoon. Welcome to another AP U.S. History video with Mr. Pate. Today we are once again in review mode, and we're looking at the subject of culture. We're going to look at schools and movements of art and periods of literature, questions that could be a full essay, frequently show up as multiple choice things. So let's talk about all of the major ones and kind of how and why they would matter in U.S. history. First is the Hudson River School of Art. This painted it's kind of these paintings kind of painted the western landscapes of the frontier and this was something that people on the east coast and in Europe had never seen anything like this the size and breadth of the uh, west and just the majesty of the west and just the enormity of these landscapes so this is something that really captured the attention of people it is going to be something that kind of ca you know catches people's interest and intrigues them about life in the west and an interest in the West as well. So it is significant for U.S. history and it is kind of the first major period of art done is the paintings of these Western landscapes. The Ashcan School of Art is social consciousness in the late 1800s on city life. Just like Jacob Rees is going to show and how the other half lives through photography how you know city life can be squalid and gross and dingy and awful in a lot of ways. Well, the Ashcan School of Art was a bunch of painters who are going to be showing precisely the same type of thing. The dirtiness and squalid nature of city life and they're going to be basically just trying to shine a light on the, this problematic lifestyle that leads to disease and crime and all these problems. So it's kind of a social consciousness on city life. That's the Ashcan School of Art, later 1800s. Harlem Renaissance is going to come, of course, in the 1920s. Now, I think sometimes historians look at this and say, ah, oh, Harlem Renaissance. There were people who were in literature and painters who were African American before this, but you have this great kind of explosion in the 1920s. Um, you had people in the first great migration during World War I, African Americans moving out of the South, and places they locate, you see this kind of like mingling of culture that goes on, leads to a larger amount being produced. That's why it's called a Harlem Renaissance. Um, showing the frustrations and yearnings of African Americans. This is actually a literary period as well as a, you know, it's going to be kind of in what we talk about over here toward the very end. Um, some of the Harlem Renaissance writers are going to end up being some of the modernists as well. Uh, but the Harlem Renaissance the art is also going to showing the frustrations and the yearnings, the desires of African Americans uh, about where they are at, their state of existence in, in the United States and what they don't like in certain ways about that. The New Deal, uh, there was going to be a, a program uh, that was created by Roosevelt's administration that is going to be basically hiring people to go and document the Great Depression. Um, there are a lot of famous photographs and paintings that have been done by these Depression-era artists and capturing kind of the awfulness of the Depression and how tough life was. And this was commissioned where the artists could get paid for this they you know turned over what they made to the government and then you know they basically were able to get a wage so it was just a different jobs program obviously much smaller scale when you're talking about artists versus something like the works progress administration uh, the the pop art this is going to be something that's going to be a post-world war ii thing andy warhol is the most famous guy uh, for any of these if you were to google image these different movements you will see examples of these uh, for copyright reasons, I'm not putting those up, but you could certainly go and look at them and see examples of the things I'm talking about here to maybe help it like lock into your mind a little bit better. Pop art, Andy Warhol and the Campbell's soup painting is going to be the most famous one, but you have a lot of examples of like just randomness in mass culture, things that from comic books and sports with athletes and just everyday life objects like the Campbell's soup can. And it's just a variety of things that are going to be shown, just kind of showing mass culture in the consumer society of the United States. And this is going to be kind of centralized in the 60s, a little bit, 50s, a little bit beyond, but, uh, in, you know, beyond the 60s. But largely, that's what the pop art scene is, and that's kind of the last one. Um, all of these are showcasing America at different time periods, and there are larger groups of artists that are doing it. That's why I feel they're the most significant things to share with you. Moving on to periods of literature... Uh, there are some people who defy a period, but they're just outstanding individuals. Jonathan Edwards is going to be like the great early theologian. He's the first great awakening guy. And he 
Um, he's a brilliant theologian who just churns out volumes of stuff that uh, Protestant Christians to this day find incredibly influential, insightful, and, and really well-written, intelligent stuff. Um, so he's kind of a significant voice of the First Great Awakening. Benjamin Franklin, obviously, through the latter half of the 1700s, is going to be a significant voice. He has an autobiography of Benjamin Franklin that's renowned. He writes this thing called Poor Richard's Almanac. Um, you know, all kinds of different literature related to Benjamin Franklin, but those would be the two biggest things that he's known for is Poor Richard's Almanac and his autobiography. Alexis de Tocqueville is going to come in after the American experiment has gotten started post-revolution, and he writes a book called Democracy in America, kind of reporting back to Europe what it's like in the United States under this democratic experiment. Significant insights and observations of what America was like at that time, so it's valuable from our perspective. Also influential in Europe, as people saw this and saw that it actually could work, uh, it was a significant force there as well. So the first period of our four we're going to look at is the Romantic period, and we're looking at this time in the early 1800s, and this is the first period of like really what you would consider significant, a significant period of American literature that's, you know, at the time Americans were looked at as intellectually lightweight by the Europeans, so Americans finally kind of get it going in terms of literature here. Uh, now, of course, we know with people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, and Alexander Hamilton, the Americans were not intellectual lightweights. They were brilliant. There were a lot of brilliant people, but they're seen culturally as lightweights at least. Romantic period is kind of a focus on feelings and the individual. Um, sometimes the plots were un unrealistic things, you know, man against you know nature or something like that. Nathaniel Hawthorne writes The Scarlet Letter. Uh, looking at kind of morality in, in New England. Um, Herman Melville with Moby Dick, kind of this man against the forces of nature. Edgar Allan Poe, renowned uh, poet, obviously. Um, <clears throat> you could throw Emily Dickinson in a little bit later here. Um, actually, sorry, next group down. Uh, Washington Irving is going to write Legend of Sleepy Hollow and The Devil of Tom Walker and a variety of other novels that are uh, renowned, and Harry Beecher Stowe writes the most important book as far as U.S. history goes, uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, moving on, uh, kind of a subset of the um, Transcendentalist movement, uh, of the Romantic period, you have the Transcendentalist movement, and you, you know, focus on feelings of the individual, it's going to get even more refined. The Second Great Awakening influenced Emerson, and Ralph Waldo Emerson is going to be the main guy, his protege is uh, Thoreau. Henry David Thoreau, and you know they're looking at becoming one with nature. You could know God through becoming one with nature. Find your inner light, your inner consciousness. Everybody's connected to nature, and they form a commune at Brook Farm and spur kind of a literary movement with a lot of different authors coming along, inspired by them. That's the Transcendentalist for a short period, really focused on the 1840s and into the 1850s. Uh, Thoreau is going to be kind of you know protesting the Mexican-American War, so he writes about that and different things. All right, realism and naturalism. So this is kind of confronting challenges. A character confronts challenges, and this could be either urban challenges, uh, or it could be they confront natural challenges. Uh, Mark Twain obviously writes tons of different things. Tom Sawyer, Huckleberry Finn. Uh, my personal favorite Tom, uh, of his books is A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, which from a political and historical perspective, is a really fascinating book to read. Um, but he has a ton of things where he uses satire to kind of have criticisms of the current age during the Gilded Age. Of course, he coins the term the Gilded Age as well. Um, Jack London had all these things about man versus nature and life with, you know, what's going on in the natural world. And um, Dreisler is going to um, confront urban challenges. Sister Carrie is frequently referenced as uh, a book of kind of the Gilded Age time period as well. So in terms of urban and the frontier challenges, uh, the realist and naturalist authors of the Gilded Age period are significant there. Modernism, uh, really you'd say is 20th century. Um, kind of a subset of the modernists would be muckrakers. And they're obviously the first ones to come, even though I have them down here at the very bottom. Uh, the muckrakers are um, significant in that they are 
social critics helping spur on the progressive era, Upton Sinclair with the jungle about the meatpacking industry, Ida Tarbell about the history of Standard Oil uh, Company, um, Jacob Reese, uh, how the other half lives, and Lincoln Steffens, the shame of the cities about political machines and political corruption. Thomas Nast is a cartoonist and others. You have this variety of people that um, through the late Gilded Age period and into the early 20th century, they're investigative journalists and social commentators who are ripping on the ills of society and really spur on the progressive era. Uh, but the modernism, you have a couple of different things. You have social protests that come a little bit later on with Steinbeck, uh, John Steinbeck, who, among other things, the Grapes of Wrath, capturing the experience of Okies who head to California during the Dust Bowl. Um, you have Richard Wright, who's writing about racism in America from the perspective of a black man. His book, Black Boy, is an amazing look into segregated society and what it was like to grow up black during segregation. Um, Langston Hughes is, of course, um, kind of a guy who comes out of the Harlem Renaissance. He's a poet and writer and an influential individual as well. During the 1920s, you have a bunch of kind of critics of society in a different way who are portraying a disillusionment with society uh, coming out of World War I and the, into the materialism and consumerism of the 1920s. And these people include F. Scott Fitzgerald, the great Gatsby, um, is kind of this th almost theme book of the decade um, showing how materialism is emptiness and you know a life built on just materialism is, is going to be a waste. It's kind of shown through this book. He wrote a lot of other books on the same types of themes. And he was disillusioned and experiencing um, an emptiness even as he became rich and famous and he and his wife had some personal challenges. Um, Ernest Hemingway, of course, would be another good example. And he's going to be looking at all kinds of different themes, some of which include World War I. And again, this kind of disillusionment and a darkness at this time period, uh, looking at World War I and, and the 20s materialism. So that is a fairly quick look at the major periods of art, the major periods of literature, some of the key names to know. These are, I think it's fairly comprehensive to what you could see um, on the AP exam. You're not very likely to see something that wasn't covered here. And that's all the time we have for today. Stay classy, A-Push.